I think, you know, it's interesting um, because I'm just looking at the questions and because you mentioned the um, extraordinary thalidomide storyline, um, which began, if I'm remembering correctly, because that was 1963, I think. Um, 61, 61, 61, so series five, yeah. One, series five. Um, and so I'd like to ask, start by asking you, Heidi, kind of how you choose, it's a bit about your writing process too, kind of how you find and choose those storylines and then also the research that you do to equip you to, to write them. Well, certainly with thalidomide, that was almost unique in that I am of the, I'm the same age as the thalidomide survivors. I'm, I'm, I had to stop and think how old I was then, but I, I was born in 62. So as a child growing up, I was very aware of children who were affected by thalidomide. They were very visible as they as as they should be and um so i was aware of it uh, there were some very good films and documentaries perhaps in the 70s and 80s because that's a fight for compensation that is still not resolved but i knew that thalidomide babies were being born for two or three years before the threads were drawn together. And there was an epoch making letter to the Lancet in December, 1961, um, where an Australian doctor noticed the prevalence of anomalies in newborn babies, um, where the mothers had taken medications, which could be cough mixture. It wasn't always the distaval pill. Um, <clears throat> And he made the link and suddenly there was this explosion of acknowledgement. But that was in December 1961. So I knew that revelation would come at the end of series five. Every series we do is set in a specific year. And that's purely because we do a Christmas special every year. Time has to move on between series. So um, I realized that we couldn't reveal thalidomide until the very end of series five. But what we could do is make that story richer and more meaningful by commencing that series, which, you know, the first episode normally takes place March, Easter, with the birth of the thalidomide child. So I threaded it through the series. So that was a, an almost unique example of me wanting to do something, knowing I couldn't do it until a particular series. And of course, when I first had the notion of doing thalidomide, I think we were only on series two or three. There was no guarantee we'd get to series five. We did, and you know that, and that was how that story came about. But what I always do is I do my own research relatively informally initially on the internet. I look at medical archives. Hansard is a great one. You know, if you just are prepared to spend days going, which I love doing. But you, you're literally going back to the horse's mouth. You're looking at history when it was new, history when it was policy or, um, or argument. So that, that's very interesting in a contextual way. I like to do my first storyline and then my first draft of a script just to get the story shaped up, but relying largely on my own research. And then we start to bring the experts in. Obviously the Thalidomide Society became involved, but to pull something else out of the air, perhaps um, we did an episode about Huntingdon's disease, which at that time was known about Huntingdon's chorea. And that was something I'd seen a documentary years ago um, I find any notion of a hereditary genetic disorder very poignant because you're looking at how it affects perhaps a mother and daughter, for example. But then you bring in the experts. So, and we always try and bring in two experts because inevitably, I mean, that's a good way of getting balance, but inevitably one of them will have more of an idea about what you have to do in a drama. Um, because making a factually based drama work is often about what you leave out. You can't stuff every punctilious point of research into a drama because it just becomes it, it drags it down under the water. Mm. So then um, we take expert advice on content and and that's it really. And one or two of those experts will be on set. We had a wonderful, very elderly dentist came on set a few times bringing his wife because at one point we had a dentist and, you know, dental care was very different then. So it's a case of me getting the inspiration, me doing my own research, but then bringing in the experts to make sure we're watertight. Mm. And it's interesting what you're saying, Heidi, about, <clears throat> you know, of course, it's very important that it's a drama mm. and not having to shoehorn too many kind of facts or information mm. points i wonder steve yeah. um you know maybe if if that was perhaps i'm guessing you know some of the impetus behind something like dr turner's casebook yeah. because in your as i you know your other life as a, as a science yeah. communicator that must be very important to you there's a marvelous science communication point with with all of this wearing my other hat which is that you know what heidi articulated beautifully then was you begin with the fact a lot of people talk um and even in science communication, they talk about, yes, but is it accurate? 
you've got to be accurate. Is it accurate? Accuracy. And nobody quite unpicks that word. But Heidi brought up some very interesting things then. It's worth unpicking them. What do we mean when a drama is accurate? Okay, so if you take, um, let's use the Down syndrome example. Um, when we've had stories more than once, and of course we have a leading character who is someone who has Down syndrome. And he is every part, Danny is every part a part of our production. Now, if you say, well, accuracy is making sure that a story about Down syndrome is accurate. Now, if you go to a doctor, as a scientist, if you go to a doctor and you ask about accuracy for Down syndrome, he will tell you rightly about the chromosomes and they may be something about um, palace tetralogy, uh, phallus tetralogy, or about the facial appearances, and all of those, and they're all accurate, and they're all things, but are they the ultimate accuracy for drama? No. Accuracy begins there, but then, if you bring in the Down Syndrome Association, then of course we would bring in, is that what you want to know in drama is, what kind of names did they call your child? What did it mean? Could you educate your child? What did your child feel? And by the time an actor gets to set, it's mm. how do we feel about this? Okay, we know what the facts are. So the facts are begin as a kernel. And I like to call it authenticity. So facts start, you get some clinical, let's call it clinical facts or scientific facts, but they're only the tiny kernel around which wider facts, social facts, because drama is a social animal, a communicative animal. And in science communication, that's only the beginning. And so what I've got to be, say, through the doctor who, who, who I, I, watches this child survive through the night and realizes it's a survivor, that's not just about chromosomes. The chromosomes are important and clinical facts are important. Using the right equipment is important. But that's, but by the time guys like us get onto the set, what you really want is, what does it mean? How scared would he be? How would he feel about this? And this is life. This is where drama becomes life. One more thing to say about the science communication of our series is, is uh, scientists often talk about, you know, scientists talk to the general public, this entity, the strange weird entity of which they are actually a part. But there's a lovely separation. Of, and science communicators know this debate well. You say, well, what is the general public? What is this a great untermenschen, you know, these general public? And of course, it doesn't really exist. The public is a wild and wild and, and amorphous thing. And actually, you're dealing with, you're in there, you're involved in the public. What we're doing in our show, um, what do medics do? Most people in Britain, and the one in six you talk about, they probably don't see a scientist all of their lives, most people. You don't have, you don't go and borrow a cup of sugar from the, the astronomer next door, usually, you know? But and what I know, what I realized playing this character years ago is they all know one scientist in the community, a science practitioner, the doctor. And a doctor medicine is the one interface, the popular interface where you meet humans, not only at that, but significantly. What doctors and medics represent, probably to all of us, is not simply the only scientific practitioner most of us will ever actually have a relationship with, but the human face of science turned to the people. And that face, if you take the NHS without putting too fine a point on it, or Dr. Turner as a GP, it's a kind face. It's a human face that says, something's wrong, let's try and fix it. So actually this beautiful interface that historically that medicine has been, we are doing science communication, but the nature of that relationship is so much more than getting just the science right. And that's what doctors know. And that's what we try and do, if that makes any sense. Yes, absolutely. It, it certainly does. It certainly does. And, um, uh, you know, talking just then about Dr. Turner, Dr. Turner is, of course, and this is, you know, no spoilers here, um, but is... Um, <laughs> is a man yeah yeah <laughs> and we have um we have a, a very good question um here i think from um, michael um who asks how important is it to the concepts that we're all talking about now um being described is it that the story is largely set within the bounds of a religious order and it's run and delivered by women you mm -hmm. know heidi first yeah yeah <laughs> i i think it, it is an interesting
interesting one because at that time, it, most GPs were men. And interestingly, you know, just to pull it back to my own personal experience, um, I recently went to a male GP to get a top up of routine medication. And I wanted to discuss my HRT, I, which, which, to which I am devoted. You'd have to prize it from my cold dead hands. But the, the male GP said, actually, I'm not really up to speed with this. He said, male GPs these days don't deal with the gynecological things. It's not their realm of expertise because women now go to female doctors for their for their general GP care, certainly for most things below the collarbone. And, um, and so that's quite interesting. Dr. Turner as a GP, yes, he's male. One of the things I found very interesting just as a dramatist is the, the sort of the levels of respect and status between the GPs and the midwives. Our own midwife consultant said to us, if ever a doctor attends a birth, he will always be the one who hands the baby to the mother, probably because even forceps or anything, because he reigns supreme. What you see with Dr. Turner is he's a man who does respect his female colleagues. Um, but in order to get the correct balance there, you, we also have a male gynecologist in the hospital, Mr. Kenley, who much more represents the you know, the patriarchal, slightly dismissive. He plays it very well and bless that act. He's never come to me and said, can I have a bit more light and shade? Because yeah. he's representing a historic truth. And certainly many women of my mum's generation, she had her children. I was born 62 and her youngest was born in 1970. They did not have a good word to say about their male obstetricians and gynecologists. I think Dr. Turner does represent something that was unique to that period, which is the GP obstetrician um, who would deliver babies as well in a domestic setting or in his own little maternity home I do think it's important that our gaze is female in call the midwife mm -hmm. that is absolutely you know my gaze is clearly female um it is based on a memoir written by a retired midwife and we go behind closed doors into spaces that women would only go into in our earlier series men were not allowed in the room in the very first episode sister Evangelina says to a laboring woman you meet your mother and nurse Lee and everybody else can stay outside and in actual fact in that episode the ghost of Steve's own father appeared because Steve was born at home delivered by a midwife who came on a bike in a blizzard legendary really but um Steve's older brother can remember coming downstairs and finding his dad sitting on the bottom stair, completely excluded from the entire process. And I wanted that energy to suffuse the show. It is a story about women's experience in relation to birth. We are letting men in the room now. And, and I like that. It's broadened out our palette of characters. We do have men who are more concerned, men who want to be at the birth or indeed don't want to be at the birth, but their wives have been to a class and think it might be a nice idea. So I do think it's important that we're including the male perspective, but for me, the female gaze will always be the most important uh, thing and our defining feature probably. To add that, absolutely my agreement to that, if I could jump in, Erica. Um, first of all, um, last year I was, was privileged to judge um, the Royal Society Science Book Prize. And me and a large panelist of people were delighted to award Caroline Criado Perez's book, Invisible Women, as the prize. And it's won many other prizes, I believe, as well. Now, just very briefly, this is a book because it's pertinent. This is a book which talks about an incredible data gap in all parts of our society, largely also in medicine, that simply we haven't looked at women's medicine in the way that Heidi described the story. Well, I don't really know about HRT. Half the species don't have enough data. We don't have enough because the male skew of them for so long has meant that we are dangerously short of essential information on half the species. And if you take that as a political starting point to say, well, if it was all solved and all different now, then we wouldn't have that book out last year being the bestseller. So if you begin with that, I absolutely agree with Heidi about the male gaze. As a character, as a male character in the series, I always say to people myself, no, absolutely, ultimately, even though we have a family as the Turners, even though I'm a principal GP in the drama, it is absolutely seen correctly through the lives and the trajectories of these women, as it should be. And the final point on that is, although Dr. Turner can contrast nicely, counterpoint nicely with Kenley in the hospital, I do enjoy those few moments when I can flash a little bit of being a man of his time and make the women bristle a little as well 
where through his kindliness, he could actually be a little bit pompous and a little bit, not out of cruelty, because it's a bit like he used to smoke the fags. It's a reminder to people. This is not, this is not now. This is not the values were different. They were, they were not bad people, but the values were different. Yeah. Remember, we're just reminding you that it's not the, the present day, you know? So that's important, but I absolutely agree about the, the, the female gaze. And there's not enough of it on television. There really isn't, but it is in our show. 